This is the Fujifilm X-H2, which along with the X-H2S that was launched a little bit earlier this year, is Fuji's latest flagship camera. It's got their fifth generation sensor, their fifth generation processor. And with the X-H2S, Fuji is saying that's all about speed, but this camera, which can record 40 megapixels, got a 40 megapixel sensor and can record video in 8K, as well as having in-body stabilization, Fuji is saying this camera is all about power. So resolution on the X system has been hovering at around 24 to 26 megapixel ever since the X-T2, so for three generations now. It looked as though Fuji were only really interested in pushing the resolution in their GFX cameras. So this is quite a big jump and big news for Fuji users. Now I was able to use the camera for about five days while I was in New York and get a feel for it and see what it's like. Now I'm actually a landscape photographer. I'm generally at home out in nature, shooting mountains, shooting snow in winter. Street photography, it's not really my thing. It's not what I do and I'm not particularly good at it. But shooting on the streets of New York, it did give me an idea of, of what this camera feels like to use because the intuitiveness of a camera is very important to me. It's one of the things that attracted me to the Fuji system in the first place. And I also got a really good idea of what the output's like, the resolution, how good the video is, and most importantly, whether this camera is worth investing in. Now, in terms of the build quality, this isn't a particularly small camera. It's bigger than the X-T4 and a little bit heavier as well at 660 grams. It is quite a bit lighter than the original X-H1, but it does feel quite large. Now, that's not really that much of a problem. Uh, it has a big grip, so it feels really good in the hand. I think a lot of people are going to like shooting with it because it does. it is very easy to grip. Having this deeper grip makes it, I think, quite a lot easier to hold than something like the X-T4, which has a much shallower grip. And I spent days walking around New York with this, just holding this in my hand, and I never once felt tired. It never once felt awkward. It always felt good in the hand and was very easy to shoot with. Now, in terms of the absolute build quality, when I first started using it, when I first opened the box, I didn't feel that it felt as well constructed as something like the X-T4. I'm not sure, it just came out of the box. That was like a first impression. But after using it for quite a while, that's kind of gone away. It does feel really solid now. It's been rained on quite a lot in New York. I also use the X-H2S in Iceland, and the X-H2S has the exact same body as this. That got rained a lot on there. So the weather sealing really does work. I've really put it through its, I put this through its paces. I put the X-H2S through its paces. And I don't have any uh, any doubts about the weather sealing on the camera. And it does feel really, really solid. It isn't as big a chunk of metal. It doesn't feel as solid as something like the GFX, but it is obviously a much smaller camera than that. Now, both X-H2, this one and the X-H2S, they share the same design language as cameras like the X-S10 and cameras like the GFX in that they don't have all of the dials on top for controlling ISO, for shutter speed and exposure compensation. There's just one PSAM dial here and most of the exposure controls are with the dial at the front or with the dial at the back here. So it's a different language. If you're really familiar with and you really like using cameras like the X-T4 or the X-T30, those kind of more, let's shall we say, retro-styled cameras, this isn't going to feel as intuitive to switch to. But if you've been using the X-S10 or if you've been using the GFX a lot, then it is very natural to kind of switch between those cameras and this. Now, I quite like the controls and layout on this camera. I've been using the X-S10 and the GFX for a while now, so this felt like a natural crossover to me. It does feel like it fits very nicely beside those cameras. One thing that I do miss is the front dial heel can control aperture and the back dial controls uh, shutter speed. On the GFX, you can click this dial in, so this will then control the ISO, uh, and then click it out again to control aperture. Now, uh, we asked Fuji about that at the recent Fuji Kino, and they said the reason for losing the click on the front dial was that they felt that this was much faster to operate, that you were less likely to accidentally click it and change controls that you didn't want to. I kind of take the point, but it is something that I miss. Um, so basically I've got aperture set up at the front, shutter at the back, and then you can see that there's a dial on the top. You just click this and this gives you control to the ISO with the, with the dial at the rear. It's not as nice as having immediate access to it as you do on a camera like the X-T4, but it does work and it's not something that I found particularly problematic. Another thing that it misses is a physical dial on the front or anywhere on the camera to control the focus mode, manual focus or autofocus, which is something I personally use a lot. I like to switch between manual focus when I've got the camera on a tripod and autofocus if I'm hand holding. Now again, because so many of these dials and buttons are customizable, you can easily set it up. I've got it on this back button here, so I just press this and then I can cycle through manual focus or autofocus. So it is very quick and easy. It's probably easier than actually turning the camera around and using the dial at the front. 
but it's just something that I missed and something that I did notice when I first started using the camera. So along the top, you've got four buttons in a line. You've got a front button at the front, which basically allows you just to immediately start recording video. Then you've got a slightly larger ISO button, then a white balance button, and then a custom mode button. Now on the back, you've got the joystick here. It's a slightly different joystick to what you get on the X-T4. Again, much more similar to something that you'll find on the GFX. It does fall quite nicely under the thumb. Uh, I don't find it as easy to manipulate as something as the X-T4, but it's not problematic when you're scrolling through the menus. It's also got the D-pad, so you can scroll you, you can scroll through the menus just as easily with the D-pad, and all of these buttons are customizable. And it does also have the flip-out screen that you get on the X-T4 and on the XS10. Now, I know this is quite a divisive thing. I personally prefer the articulating screen that you get on cameras like the X-T3 or that the GFX has. I really do like that as a landscape photographer. It works much better when you're using the camera on a tripod. But if you're recording video, being able to turn the camera around and record yourself makes things much easier, like I'm doing now with the XS10. Another thing that's noticeable about this is the card slots. Now, traditionally on Fuji's flagship cameras like the X-T series, you get two card slots. This does have two card slots, but one of those slots is for CF Express, so you don't have the dual SD cards anymore, which means if you want to shoot uh, with dual cards, you're gonna have to invest in a CF Express card, and they are, at the moment, quite a bit more expensive than SD cards. Like all memory, I expect the prices will come down in a couple of years or so, but right now, it's an added expense. Now, when I originally saw that on the X-H2S, I assumed that was because of the really high speed recording that that camera does, but it is also on this and it's not necessary, it's not particularly needed. You can shoot 8K video in F-Log2 onto an SD card. I didn't try with the Apple ProRes, so I don't know if that's possible, but for most of the uses that I have, I can use just the SD card, but I do like having two cards. It just makes things a lot easier for backup, for security, just for, for convenience. So it does mean that I'm gonna to have to invest in a CF Express card if I want to get the most out of this. And one other thing worth noting for, for people who shoot on a tripod with an L bracket like me is that Fuji have moved the remote control connector to the other side, to the same side as the camera of the battery, which means that when you've got the camera and you've got an L bracket, you can now plug the remote control in because before when the remote was on this side, it kind of was where the L bracket connected with the tripod, which made it absolutely impossible to use. So that for me is a really nice touch. The resolution on the electronic viewfinder has been increased to 5.76 million dots from 3.69 million dots on the X-T4. So that means that this now has the same resolution viewfinder that you find in Fuji's top, top camera, the GFX100, and a better resolution than you find in the GFX 100S, which has the same resolution as the X-T4. Now this is noticeable. When I was using it, I did really notice it in the field. The picture is just a little bit sharper. There's a high, little bit more detail. It just feels a little bit crisper, and it's something that actually felt quite nice. Fuji also claim they've increased the, the in-body camera stabilization to seven stops from six and a half stops. Now, I'm not sure how much difference half a stop is going to make in terms of image stabilization, and these things are very difficult to measure anyway. But image stabilization is really good, particularly on a camera with so much resolution, on a camera that you're going to use a lot as a video, and seven stops is quite a lot. It should allow you to shoot handheld at shutter speeds of up to one over 200. So it does make a difference, uh, but how bigger improvement it is over something like the X-T4 is something that I really don't know if I can measure or not. Now the battery is the same as the X-T4 and the GFX 100S, but Fuji are claiming that they've optimized it so you can get 10% more shots out of it. So they're saying you can get 680 shots out of it as opposed to around 600 on the X-T4. Now again, I did find the battery life really useful. I was walking around New York shooting a lot. We did a helicopter flight where I was shooting a lot, shooting 4K video, shooting 8K video, shooting burst mode to test out the autofocus chimping a lot, looking at the back of the screen, and I managed to get through a whole day uh, easily just on one battery. It wasn't really a problem. So battery life is really good. And for landscape shooters, where, where I tend to shoot a lot less when I'm out in the field, this battery is gonna last me probably a couple of days before I'm gonna have to recharge it. Now, autofocus is big news in the new cameras in the X-H2 and the X-H2S. Fuji are claiming that they've made quite a big improvement with it over cameras like the X-T4. 
No, it's hard for me to say because as a landscape photographer, I mostly shoot in manual focusing with 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 high, with highlight peaking. And when I do shoot with autofocus, I'm generally not shooting fast moving subjects. I don't really shoot action or, or anything like that. However, I put it through its paces a little bit, and I was really amazed at how good it is. Uh, it has different settings, so you can set it for facial recognition. You can set it to recognize animals or bikes or cars or buses. And I found that it really was effective. When you just touch the button, it latched on, and it really was very sticky. It tracked the subject all the way across the screen, whether they were coming towards me, whether we were, we were panning with them, and pretty much nailed focus every single time. I reached a point with this where I was shooting out of focus when we were doing street photography. I just didn't really worry about the focus anymore because I knew that it was going to nail it. I knew that it was going to focus on, on pretty much what I wanted it to focus on and stay focused on that no matter how much the subject moved or how much I moved the camera. So it really did make a big difference. I'm not the right person to compare it with previous cameras and I certainly can't compare it with other systems because I don't use other systems, but I did feel that this was an excellent, a really, really, really good autofocus system. All right, so what about the image quality in this camera? It has a 40 megapixel CMOS X-Trans 5HR sensor, the 5 being for fifth generation and the HR being for high resolution. And Fuji are claiming that it is the highest resolution in any APS-C camera. Now, I don't know about that. I, I can't speak for every other brand. Now, 40 megapixels on an APS-C sensor is very high resolution. It has a higher pixel density, for example, than something like the GFX 100S, which has 100 megapixels, but on a much bigger sensor. So I was curious to see uh, see what the resolution is like on this camera and also to see what the noise performance is like shooting low light with high ISOs. Now in real world shooting, that increased resolution translates as about 7,700 pixels along the longest edge, which when it comes to printing, if you're printing at 250 to 300 DPI or about 100 pixels per centimeter, your prints are gonna come out at about 77, almost 80 centimeters uh, along the longest edge native prints, which is quite a bit bigger than the 62 centimeters that you could get from the 26 megapixel sensor on the X-T4. And I'm not very good at maths, but that's about a 25% increase in print size along the longest edge which is significant for prints and of course the more resolution you have the more detail you have the, the easier it is if you want to up res your prints if you want to make them bigger using something like gigapixel so the more detail the better if you want to print large but whether you need that amount of resolution for your day-to-day -day shooting if most of your if most of your work is just going on to the internet you probably don't really need 40 megapixels but it does give you a lot more detail to crop into and if you're just the kind of person that likes zooming into your images and looking at them at 100%. Another thing that Fujifilm have given this that before now only existed in the GFX is pixel shift technology where when the camera's on the tripod, you can set it up to shoot 20 images and it will move, the camera will move using the IBIS system it will move the sensor a little bit in each direction and capture a very high resolution file. It will actually quadruple the resolution, giving you something like 160 megapixel images. Now that's great if you're shooting something like a still life or if you're archiving, if you're shooting paintings or something like that. In real world photography, it, it's not actually super useful because during the course of taking those 20 images, anything that moves is going to be blurred. So if you're shooting landscapes and there's grass moving or there's leaves moving or anything like that, then you're going to get a blur that they're not going to get detail there. You're just going to get blur. So it's something when I've been using the GFX, I've not found it super useful unless I'm shooting a scene where there's absolutely zero movement whatsoever, which is quite rare for my kind of photography. The other thing about having such a high resolution count is that not all Fuji's lenses are optimized for it, particularly not the old the heritage lenses like the ones that came out at the beginning of the X system things like the 35 1.4 so Fuji have been updating a lot of their lenses and there's a list on the website of what lenses are actually optimized to use the sensor now by optimized to use the sensor what that actually means is they will get you every bit of resolution that the sensor is capable of getting yeah, you will be able to capture the lens the lens is also capable of matching it but that doesn't mean that you won't see a massive improvement with some older lenses if you're using something like the older 10 to 24 
or something like even like the kit lens like the uh, like the 18 to 55 you're not going to maximize it every pixel you're not going to get the best out of the sensor but you're still going to see a significant improvement you're still going to be shooting a 40 megapixel image but let's have a look now at what kind of images you can get and what the quality of the output is actually like so let's first have a look at the resolution of the camera. Now this is an image taken with the X-H2 and this is an image taken with the 26 megapixel XS10 using the same lens and the same focal length. So if we look at them both side by side, you get an idea of what the difference in resolution is. When you zoom in, you can see how much bigger everything is on the camera with the, with the higher megapixel count. So over here we've got the X-H2 and you can see this door, for example, or this car down here, they're so much larger because they have so many, there's so many more megapixels on each thing. So you can zoom in a lot deeper and still keep the same level of detail. Now let's have a look at some of the detail that you get in the images when you zoom in. So this is taken with the uh, with the 20 with the 10 to 24 at 24 millimeter. It's straight out of camera, so it's the raw file. It hasn't been sharpened, hasn't been touched in any way. And you start to see when you look deep into the image down here, you look at the detail in the trees, how much resolution there is, how much detail you've got. Uh, there's just so much going on in the image. We can zoom in a little bit further and you can see here on the sign. Now, if we were looking with 26 megapixel camera here, we just simply wouldn't have the amount of detail. Now, this is a handheld shot. It's not on a tripod, so it's not super sharp. Uh, as I say, I haven't done anything to it in post-processing, but you really start to get an idea of how much detail is being resolved now this image is also taken at the base ISO. This is taken with the 70 to 300, which I think is a sharper lens than the 10 to 24. And you can see now this is a very tall skyscraper and I'm only at 165 millimeters here. But you can see something so far away with a telephoto lens, how you can pull it so close to you and get so much detail out of it. We can see these, out, these cables here and a little bit of detail on the skyscraper. Now this is an image taken at a slightly higher ISO. It's taken from a, a moving helicopter above Manhattan. So we had to increase the ISO a little bit, try to keep a relatively fast shutter speed because the helicopter was moving and we didn't want to have too much movement blur and also shot wide open at f1.4 on the new 23 millimeter f1.4. Now I've done a little tiny bit of work on this. I've done a little bit of noise reduction and just pushed up the exposure a tiny little bit. So yeah, I shot, I did underexpose because I was trying to use a fast shutter speed and keep the, um, keep the movement blur down to an absolute minimum. But you can see just with a little bit of work, just with a little bit of noise reduction and pushing the exposure up, this is a, a really good image. I could certainly print this. You could print this to about 60 centimeters wide. And the amount of detail that's being resolved here in the streets with the cars from a wide angle lens from quite a long way away really is quite impressive. Now, this is a high ISO image taken at ISO 3200 with the 10 to 24 at f8. Uh, the camera, it's not handheld. I was kind of resting the camera on a, on a wall, kind of wall here. And you can see that there is definitely noise when we look into the shadows. We look around the people here and in the corners. If you look here, you can start to see noise. But overall, this is a very good performance. That's a relatively bright place, Grand Central Station. There's not a lot of shadow detail there when you look in the shadows under here, and, and particularly under here, I guess. You start to see some of the noise and some of the degradation of detail. But overall, for ISO 3200, this is a very usable image. This one is taken at ISO 5000, same place, the, the same settings in the camera. You can see, again, more noise starting to come here. But again, it's surprisingly usable around the people here and on the floor in the shadows. It is starting to break down. I don't know if I'd really want to print this full size, but it is very usable. And I think that there is, for me, a little bit of an improvement over what I was getting with the X-T4. Now, when it comes to video, I found the output to be absolutely outstanding. As I said before, it shoots in 8K footage at up to 30 frames per second. Now, obviously, most people are not going to be using an 8K timeline, but what 8K gives you is the capacity to really crop deep into the videos and still keep 4K footage. So basically, it doubles the focal length of any lens you're using, whether you're using a prime or a zoom. You can just crop in a lot more and double your focal length and still keep 4K. It shoots also in 6.2K, again, up to 30 frames per second. And you've got 4K at up to 60 frames per second, which allows you just to slow down the footage a little bit. In terms of data transfer, you're getting, if you're using the CF Express card, it maxes out at 720 megabits per second on an SD card. 
then your data transfer tops out at 200 megabits per second. And also you've got all of the film simulations that you usually get on Fuji cameras, as well as F-Log, F-Log2 and Apple ProRes. Now these are low compression codecs, which uh, record a really large amount of data, which gives you a huge amount of leeway when it comes to editing and grading the footage later on. I shoot almost exclusively in F-Log. I didn't really try out the Apple ProRes because that really is a very high-end codec. I simply just don't need that level of quality for my own video footage. Overall then, I think this is the biggest jump that the X system has made since the X-T2. Not just in terms of the resolution, which is significant. There was 40 megapixels. If you're shooting a lot of print work, if you really need that high resolution, then obviously that's gonna make a big difference. But the other features as well, things like the 8K video, which allows you to shoot, which allows you to shoot and crop into the video or allows you to really use a lot of stabilization on the video that you're shooting. Things like the massively improved autofocus system or just things like using the CF Express card which can really speed up your workflow and the output from this camera both in terms of the still photos and the video is consistently excellent and I've been really really impressed with it. Now I do think that a lot of the X-T4 owners are going to be looking at this camera and thinking whether they should upgrade or wait for the X-T5 to come out next year or whenever that's going to be and it really is impossible to say. Fujifilm have made it clear that this is their flagship camera along with the X-H2S so any X-T5 isn't going to have features that top this but it is obviously going to have a lot of the features as Fuji always do. A lot of the features from this, a lot of the technology from this is going to be incorporated into the X-T5. What I can say is that if you're looking for the best quality in terms of video output or in terms of still photography output, then this is definitely the camera for you. Unless you're shooting really high speed, then you might want to look at something like the X-H2S. But I think for most people, for most kind of shooting, this is gonna be an excellent camera. It doesn't have the stylings and the design of something like the X-T4. So if that's your thing, then you may, might really wanna wait for that. But pretty much for everyone else, this is an outstanding camera, which has incredible output for pretty much all kinds of photography. So I think that's it for this video. I hope it's been interesting and I hope it's been useful. If you've got any questions at all, just drop them in the comment below or send me an email and I'll get back to you. And if you're interested in my photography, if you'd like to shoot with me, then please check out my website. I do workshops all year round. Next year, I'll be going to Namibia, to Greenland, to Iceland, and I'd love to have you join me so you can find full information on all the workshops that I'll be running on my website. Or of course, if you've got any questions, just drop me an email. I'd love to have you join me on a workshop. And as ever, good luck with all your photography. Thanks so much for watching and take care. See ya.